Okay, so today we start uh, discussing about the design process for emit intelligent systems, and in particular with details about the process that we are going to follow in this course. So it's, uh, we start today and finish uh, on Thursday discussing about this topic. Hmm? So uh, about the design process, uh, what, what are we aiming at? Hmm? What, uh, uh, what do we want to achieve? We want to set up some rules that help us in the design and implementation of the system. I went to Wikipedia and say and check what what do they what's the definition they give uh, about the design process. And the definition from Wikipedia is uh, the engineering design process. So actually, we are limited, limiting, focusing ourselves into design processes for engineering, not for other kinds of sectors, is, uh, is the formulation of a plan to help an engineer build product with a specified performance goal. Hmm? That's the definition from Wikipedia. I would modify it a little bit. Uh, help an engineer is too limiting. Uh, it, there are very few systems that can be built by one engineer. So I, I would correct this as a team of engineers. Uh, build the product also is limiting. Not, maybe we are not building a product. We are building also a service bundled to a product or a set of products that work together. So I would broaden the definition a bit by saying to build a system with specified goals of performance, of course, but, uh, but also functionality. Hmm? So what the system will do and what is the performance that we achieve in the system. But in all of this definition, uh, let's say, describes who is going to build what. The engineers are building systems with the performance and functionality. But the real important word is the plan. So before starting to build a system, we need a plan what we will do first and what we do next. Okay? The alternative to plan, to having a plan is uh, having a chaos. Mm -hmm. And uh, very interesting things usually come out from uh, the chaotic process. Mm -hmm. So there are many ways mm -hmm. to structure a plan in order to, give a, to, to reach a given goal. We will select one, one possible plan uh, that fits more or less the types of systems and the size of uh, functionalities that we want to achieve. So actually, I will uh, sketch a map of a possible general design process. We'll, uh, that would be, say, described in seven steps. So we go into more detail about uh, what happens in each of the steps. We start from an idea of a project. We will uh, end up with the implementation of the product and the validation and testing. So what happens in the, in the different phases? And uh, at the end, it will happen on Thursday, we will try to highlight and map and reduce and shrink and simplify the process in order to fit it into our course. <coughs> we, will, we will see that some activities cannot be carried out in the limited uh, time that we have available. So we'll cut corners in a way. Hmm? OK, uh, every now and then, I will pop up a slide like this with the warning sign a deadline ahead, just to remind us that at different points in the process, or different points in the process will map to actual deadlines that we have in the course. We already have one first deadline even before starting the process. We still don't have a system to build. So the first deadline. I remember, I remind you, is uh, uh, one week from today, something like that. Yes, seven for uh, nine days from today, the 16th of March, in which you should be able to submit uh, the composition of your group uh, and uh, a very short description of the idea that you have in mind. So we prepared the the document on uh, on Google Drive. We are yeah, we already showed you the link uh, several times of the document. 
And what you, you are asked to do is to, let's say, form the groups, to also use the time that we have in the classroom to, to discuss, and come up with uh, one or more ideas uh, about your project. So um, what we ask to fill you is a list of the team members with the name, the email in which you prefer to be contacted. So maybe it's not, uh, maybe it's the email from Polytechnic, or maybe you prefer a different one. I, we don't care. A username for GitHub in order to enable you on the projects that we will create. And I will ask you also to describe the role in the project. OK? The team of four, not everybody will do the same things as the other. So you, if you already can start each one of, uh, of the people, which is the role that we have in the project? Hmm? And uh, let, let's try to write what you have in mind, then we'll, uh, we'll revise and then give feedback also about that. And then you can describe the projects that is basically a title and a, an easy acronym that we will use to build the, 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 the repository and the description. The description is what you find on the Google Drive, five to 10 lines describing the project from the user's point of view. Don't mention any technologies, don't mention any devices uh, in this description. This we will, will come later. Okay, in a later stage in the process. That, this is the first constraint that we have from our process, our plan. The plan is first to devise something useful for the users. Then we will sort out how to implement them, which devices we need to use, which technologies we need to exploit, and so on. Hmm? Okay, so there's a, a very short description that will uh, help us uh, uh, say, discussing with you about the idea and check whether it fits or not with the type of project we are seeking. If you upload this information even before the deadline is better, and because we can start looking, maybe we can start giving you some replies or some ideas. Usually we write, uh, we check every couple of days, we check the Google Drive, and we, we put comments uh, besides the, 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 what you write. Hmm? It's just a very open phase. Don't be afraid of writing uh, silly things or, or, even, or even worse. I, we, will do, we will just write, this is not a good project, and then uh, come up with a different idea. So I, it's, it's just a, an open discussion. The goal for everybody, for you and us, is to uh, converge at the 18th of, of March with uh, solid ideas of projects. If a group or a person has more than one idea, they can list them. So maybe we can evaluate two or three ideas per group, and we say, OK, we think this is the better one. This is better than the other, or this is the, so we can check huh, and see, OK, you, we suggest you to work on this idea and make it better, and maybe leave the others out. <coughs> Sometimes it happens that a group may have several good ideas, Another group may run out of good ideas. And so uh, one idea that is left over from another group uh, can be used or reused or uh, copied by a group that is lacking. So let's try to share this. Of course, nobody will, uh, will steal your idea uh, uh, if you need it for your project. Hmm? But if, you, if it's an additional good idea, it can be used by, uh, by other groups. OK, so just to remind you and uh, to scare you once more. This is before starting the process. For the team, we have an idea. And uh, the reason uh, why we uh, come up with this uh, need for a process is actually trying to, to control the all too common problem that ha happens in every project you have. Uh, this is a very common picture. Maybe you're already seeing it in every, let's say, software engineering class. Uh, it always comes out. The importance requirements. Uh, the, basically, okay, the, the, the letters are too small to read on the screen, but uh, you can read them on the slides. Um, they say that uh, the same uh, uh, system, we did a system how the customer explained it. Uh, 
And then how the project leader understood it and was different. How the analyst designed it, how the programmer wrote it, how the business consultant described it, how the project was documented, and this uh, empty, this is very common, what operations installed, how the customer was billed hmm, was for pain, how it was supported, and what the customer really needed. Hmm. So this means that the, the same process is, uh, if we have three or four or five or eight people this, uh, talk, talking about the same project, they will always think at different uh, f um, things. Huh? They will see different things. They will understand it differently. Hmm? So we, we need to be sure that actually the system that we build is what the customer really wants, and not what we understand about what the user could possibly um, uh, say want. Huh? And this is why we need to be systematic in our work, not just uh, taking it for granted. Huh? We will be very, let's say, nasty and picky in evaluating your deliverables and your documents uh, just because we want to be, uh, we, we want you and you need to be very precise in what you describe. Uh, don't leave anything to imagination or to approximation because otherwise uh, at the end you will, maybe in the last weeks, you will discover that you are doing the wrong thing. You are building a system that is not actually what you wanted or what you had in mind. Hmm? And by the way, one, uh, Worrying thing is the difference between the first and the last picture. You see, the last picture says what the customer really needed, and the first picture is how the customer explained it. So we can't even trust the customer to explain what they want. And this is normal because the customer is not an expert, an expert in technologies. We are the designers. We should try to understand that. So this is the main. Uh, worry about the process, the design process. Being able to consistently design actually what is needed by the customer. And uh, there are many ways of doing that. Every company has their own design process where you're going to go and work in a company. One of the things that will explain you at the beginning is how they work, what is the process. What are the specifications? Who writes them? What proves them? Who writes the code? What are the tests? And so on. How they work for delivering the product. You must hope to go in a company that has a process. Otherwise, it will, it's not a good sign for the, for the company. So there are many types of processes. We, we choose one. We choose one that more or less fits the types of systems that we are going to design here. So we, we analyze one possible project and try to explain the different steps of this uh, selected process. Um, we, of course, we'll need to take into account, as always, as we any pro process, with the constraints. Time, the type of project, the type of technology that we have, and so on. So we try to also to scale down the, project, the process according to the, the requirement that we have. We already know the starting and the ending point of the process. The starting point is the idea. It's what you will develop during this week, before the, the, 7, the 16th of March. The idea, five to 10 lines describing the idea of the project. This is the starting point, the description of what we want to achieve. The end point of the project, of the process, is a working prototype. Something to show in the lab and to describe, which is complete, documented, presented, and polished, and working. Hmm? So we already know the two extremes, starting and ending point. We need to go to see what we have in between. First, we make some uh, big choices, some strategic assumptions. We want to work with a technology-neutral approach. It means that we are not trying to push any single technology. Okay, if I were the inventor of a smartwatch, I would try to imagine any kind of project that just needs a smartwatch to work. It should be there because it's my technology, I want to push it, I want to sell it. 
Okay? If you're very fond of some kind of technology, because you just learned it yesterday and you love it, you will try to, in, to push it into your project at, at all costs. I, we don't want to follow this bottom-up approach from technology to project. Huh? We want to devise a project that starts technology neutral. So at the beginning, we don't think about technology. We don't mention specific technologies. Because maybe the same idea can be implemented with different kinds of technologies. There will be alternatives, way, alternative ways of implementing the same thing. Or maybe this year, technologies uh, will be different. Will, the optimal choice for 2006 technologies will be different for the optimal choice in 2018. So we want also to work on ideas that can survive technology evolution. Technology changes every six months. Is our idea based on a specific technology and so next year will be dead by definition? Or is our idea robust because it fits some needs and so can survive to the changing technology or maybe improve when new technologies come out? Hmm? So uh, the best fit technology will be selected during the process and not being defined at the beginning. Uh, we will come to a point where we have clear ideas of what the project should do, and at that point, we will ask ourselves, OK, what are the best technologies to use for achieving these results? But until the description of the system, what the system will do, is not clear enough, it's too early to think about technologies. Uh, and this is the most common say, phrase that we have to tell you. Don't think about technologies yet. Yet. We will see the date in which we can, we will free you and we'll let you talking about technologies. We'll be in a couple of months. No, one, uh, six weeks or so. Or so. Hmm? so first, think about project first, features first, functionality first, and technology last. Second assumption is uh, uh, don't reinvent existing wheels. If you find a system, a, a device, a technology, a standard, an API, um, a website, or a library, or whatever, that can be used, try to use it and integrate that into your project. As much as possible, try to rely on existing software and hardware. We have limited time. We have limited development time. Uh, we cannot build everything from zero. So the, the job here will be more on selecting and integrating components. And then, of course, we'll need to glue them together with our code, with our software. But we need to implement something only if we find no alternatives. So first, we seek if there is already maybe a sensor or a board that fits our project. And then if really we don't find anything, we can think about building it. We search about a library for solving this particular algorithm, for example. And only if we can find it really, and we, we, we searched very hard, but we didn't find it, then we can think about implementing it, and so on. So try to resist your instinct that say, OK, let's, let's write some code and solve the problem. No, stop, think, search. And it will be much easier to integrate a library or a software or a device that is already being developed, debugged, and documented, and so on. And so you can think about uh, more about the features of the system and put it together and make it work in a smoother way rather than going to the bug log level features that have, that have already been debugged and integrated in 20 different uh, products. Mm -hmm. This is valid for software, it's valid for hardware too. You saw in the lab, we are you're in the lab, you so we have a lot of devices that are already ready there. If we want to use them, they are there for you. We, are also, we also have in the lab capabilities for building new devices. You have the breadboard, the Arduinos, the wires, the resistors, and so on. 
So it's really up to you to choose. Huh? In the lab, you have more possibilities. The first choice, uh, choice would always be try to find something existing from the market. OK, these are the two main strategic choices huh? in uh, uh, setting up this project. So this is the, the overall process. Of course, we don't read the labels right now. We will zoom in one by one, just to give you a bird's eye view of uh, the initial um, as idea up to the, the users that, we act, that will actually use the system. We have uh, identified seven different steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The uh, legend is uh, every time we have a square box is an activity, a task to be done. So these square rectangles are activities. Some activities have a double bar, and they mean that these are complex activities. So they contain sub-activities. Uh, between an activity and the next one, we have the flow of the process. <clears throat> and uh, activities communicate through documents. So at the end of one phase, we have some information, documentation, that will be the input of the next phase, and so on. So this is the documentation, one or more documents. And uh, this box here represents tools, uh, actual software running. So you see that actually the software is being produced uh, quite near to the end. Huh? A lot of the process we'll have to do about uh, documentation and reasoning. Of course, maybe it, less, it requires less time to do that but we need to think separately at, this, at these different steps. So the basic uh, <coughs> sorry, structure of the process is uh, from one step to another one, when, once we finish this activity, then we can move to the next one. And finishing this activity means producing some result, some concrete, tangible result, a document, a software, a library, a video presentation, a talk, whatever, something that describes the information produced in the, in the previous step, and this is, will be the basis of the next step. And this is also important because the next step will can rely on this documentation, on this information, and we don't have to go back to the beginning every time. So what did we say at the beginning? I don't remember. Maybe the user wanted this or that. No. Every step can rely on the information collected from the previous steps, and we can go forward without going rediscussing every time from the beginning the project. Otherwise, it would be really, really a, a, um, a loss of time. Of course, no one is perfect. Mistakes happen. Problems arise. Time runs out, and uh, it we will always find ourselves in the position that we need uh, to change some, something that has already been decided. So we need to go back. Something, okay, we imagine choosing this device, then we start playing with the device, we discover that it doesn't work. Or it doesn't do what we wanted to do. Okay, we need to go back and, and select another one. Or we were, we were very ambitious at the beginning, we wanted to do many things, and then we find that the, the exam is around the corner, and so we need to go back and to rethink the project to maybe erase or remove some features so that we can finish in time. Okay, so the process is a fairly linear, what they call a waterfall model. From top to bottom, it goes down. But always imagine there will be feedbacks, and that you can you need to go back and change something, especially when you start uh, dealing with the hardware and the software. Hmm? At the beginning, you have just to think about ideas and descriptions and the users, so it's easier to get it right. But when you start uh, touching technology, then problems uh, will come to you even if you don't ask for them. Hmm? OK, so actually, we, I, I drew this diagram in columns just to separate the specification phase from the development phase. 
A specification is where we analyze the idea and transform five to 10 lines of initial idea into actually lists of uh, features that the system needs to implement. Ideally, you could also imagine that the group working on the specification could be different from the group doing development. Actually, in many companies, in real companies, this is what happens. Somebody does the analysis, as creates a specification document, and then hands over this specification to the implementation team. And in many cases, the implementation team is a subcontractor. It may be also outside the company. And they will turn this specification, which is a, a document or a set of documents, into a working system. OK? So this uh, is why it's so important to get the specification right. Uh, always try to imagine the specification as your own law. Hmm? Yeah, it's an it's a untouchable text that describes actually what the system will do. Hmm? While you start uh, developing, you will need to split four people in the group. Everyone will have different responsibility, will work in a different part of the system. You cannot every time discuss again what the system should do, the specification. So you should refer to what is written in the specification so that everybody, so that the work can be parallelized. Everybody can work on different places so that, because there is a sharing understanding of the system, which is more or less as I described by the final specification. Huh? Of course, there will be iterations, things will change. We hope that the number of changes is small. Hmm? Because every, every time you change something here, you are losing or wasting or throwing away hours or days of development. You started developing something, and then you discover you don't need it anymore. Hmm? OK. If we map this process to our deadlines, this is what we get. The idea, we don't have it yet the initial idea here. So the first step will be a step zero, defining the idea. And then we uh, will ask you three intermediate steps that in these two lectures I will try to describe you better. The vision document, the analysis document, and the design document. Three different steps. Containing more and more detailed information about your system. As we go on, the information will be more, and uh, the precision, the information about the technology also will start to appear. At the end of the, design, of the system design document, after the middle of May, OK, here you can, know, you can already start thinking about technologies. So in May, you, we, you can think about technologies. In March and April, not yet. So after this analysis, you can start about thinking about the architecture and then the design, selecting the, in, the technologies, and then go with the implementation. So we have the last month from the, after the 12th of May up to the end of the course will be around the 10th of June. One full month in which you will have practically no lectures all the time for you in the lab and on your own to work on the project. So the last month will be actually the implementation. Of course, you can start implementing something before, some pieces here and there that we, you know will, the, will be used. But the, the big effort will be in the last month, hmm? last four or five, five, week, five weeks. But we will come to this picture huh, one step at a time. So we said seven steps. Starting from the idea. The first step is to state what we want, what we call the, the problem statement. Um, imagine that the idea is five, six, eight lines of text. The problem statement could be a couple of pages, one, two pages, that describes what kind of problems the system will solve. 
it's already in the description, in the, in the vision, in the initial uh, uh, idea, but we need to describe it better. Okay? Identifying the benefits for the users, the benefits for the environment, for the ambient, and a brief summary of what the system does for users. So imagine just you already have everything in mind when you write your idea. Just unzip it, uncompress it, and write it in a longer format. Okay? We don't task a couple of pages at the beginning. We want few lines just to validate the idea. And then once the idea is validated, then you can spend more time in describing it better. And so the idea is having one page of vision, of text, where you should absolutely avoid describing the technology. I want to use a Bluetooth sensor. No. Or making technical choices, even implicit at that point. Hmm? You have to fight the, the, the programmer that is inside you. Huh? You must think like an engineer, not like a programmer. Think about the, the system, about the process, not just about the technology. Hmm? Defining the target environment, where is the system working, in which context, in which kind of ambient, uh, for which kind of users, what are the potential users. It's a home system, an office, uh, gym, uh, open space, and the bike, and transportation. No? The, the different uh, variables that we described last week. How the environment supports the users. So what the environment does for the users. What the users get from the environment, from the ambient. What is the difference for the users? Whether the system is there or not. Do they feel it? What does it change for them? Hmm? Uh, remember the definition of, of ambient intelligence. A system that proactively but sensibly supports users in their daily activities. So, so what is the support actually, concretely, practically? Hmm? And uh, so um, what we ask you is to expand to one page, more or less, just to give you an idea, the description of uh, the benefit, the function, the functionality, and the benefits from the user point of view of the system that you want to build, and then try to explain the MEI steps, the MEI features uh, of this project. So, what is the sensing part of the system? What is the reasoning part of the system? What is the acting part? What is the um, interacting part of the system? Just to help yourself to check whether you thought the full circle, and to identify whether the system is sensitive, whether it's responsive, adaptive, transparent, ubiquitous intelligence. So the features of the ambient intelligence system that we uh, saw together last week. So imagine one page of description of text and half a page of checkpoints or bullet items describing the MEI steps and the MEI features that fit into your project. A couple of pages in total. And uh, the way you write this should be written in a language for selling or for showing or for convincing non-technical people, non-engineers. Do you have a friend? Do you have a sister? Do you have an aunt? Do you have a boyfriend or girlfriend that doesn't understand anything about uh, technology? Well, they are the best persons to, to read your description and check whether they understand what you're writing. OK? It's far too easy to write something that we, we are the only ones able to understand. Hmm? Try to write it in an open way. And this is also important in the course, but more in general. When you are negotiating a system with a customer, you must be sure that the customer understands what you are going to build for them. And so you need to write it in a way the customer understands. And the customer doesn't speak Python. Huh? 
or SQL or whatever. They speak the language of the domain. Their, they do they, their job, their, their problem, they, they their type of business. So you must be able, at least at the beginning, to speak the language of the user. That means non-technical language. Okay. Maybe it's a customer, maybe it would be an investor. You're trying to get some money for funding your project, so you will go and explain it to some funding agency or venture capitalist or incubator or whatever. People, there are no management engineers here, here no? Uh, usually have a management background, so they can only understand so much. And uh, so we need to learn huh, describing things in this way. It doesn't mean writing, uh, can I say bullshit on recordings? Uh, it doesn't mean writing bullshit, or just like you know, maybe some newspaper speech uh, where there's a lot of buzzwords that don't mean anything. When you parse it in English, it doesn't mean anything. We need to be precise to the point, because actually we are describing what, you are, what, you, what we are promising to build. It's a contract. I will build and will implement this system. So it's precise, it's not ambiguous, but it's understandable. It's not easy, just one page, but it's not easy. So the tips for, for, for this step, for this initial vision document, we already mentioned that. Did we already mention it? Yes, 27 time, times. No technology. Don't describe technology, but of course, in the back of, of your mind, you must ensure that you are confident it can be built. Okay? So, we don't write technology, but we don't propose teleportation or something that uh, we already know it will be impossible. Okay? Something that more or less we are confident that, we, that it's possible. Because we know that technologies can do that. But right now, we don't spend too much time in choosing the right technology. We know that some technology will help us. Hmm? Start see few features, few types of users. One or two categories of users are more than enough. One is better than two. A very focused project. And a few features. One, two, three key important features are enough for your project. It's not a full product that, you, that tomorrow we'll, you will go and try to send it to the market, and so we, we, it, it will need to have a full set of features. Only those, those ones that contribute to the ambient intelligence nature of the project. Okay, just to save your time, save your energy, and concentrate and focus on the most important aspects. There's always time to add features. It's more difficult to remove them if you start with too many and then you, you don't know what to delete. Pitch it. Try to explain it to others. Huh? Explain why the users should would be happy to use it, would really want to use it. Hmm? Try these pitches with your friends. They will help you, I know. Hmm? But try them and see the reaction. Oh, yes, really? Oh, no, I want this. Hmm? Try to, to check. And a way to pitch it is to try to tell a story. Not, don't make a list of the features of the system at this point. We will come to that later. But tell what uh, John or Jane is going to do this morning. A system that supports users in their daily activities. So let's describe these daily activities and how they change thanks to our system, to your system. Okay? So it's just a way of writing it so to make it easier uh, to describe to the others. Also important, Google it. We are all geniuses. We are, each, each of us is better than, than Einstein. We have the best ideas in the world, or maybe not. So it's very likely that our idea is similar to something that already 
has been described or implemented or something similar. And uh, try to imagine that you have this idea and you want to buy a system. Search for it. Uh, so just so be, be, the, be the user. I want to be the user of a system. Let's search Google or the, the, the internet to check whether such product actually exists. Uh, maybe it's a list. Uh, it's, it's already existing. We don't care. We, don't, we are not trying to do something totally new in this course. It's OK if there's already something very similar. But seeing other things uh, can give us a flavor uh, or some ideas, some suggestions of features that to include or not include, or how to dis differentiate. Mine is better because, because I changed things, and so on. So let's try not just to be too focused on your idea and try to see your idea from the external and how it compares to actual systems that are there. Hmm? And uh, involve the users also. Hmm? You are doing something for maybe housemates, to help housemates. Go and talk to some of them. You are doing something for the gym. Go and talk and speak to some gym instructor. If you're doing something for pets, it will be more difficult to, to but for the pet owners, you can talk to the pet owners instead of the pets or the vets. Hmm? That, uh, and so on. Try to describe the system to the potential users so you can get feedback. And don't try to convince the users that your system is the best. Try to listen from them so they will tell you in which areas your system is a bit too weak and which areas need to be strengthened. Hmm? So it's easy to talk, it's much more difficult to listen. Hmm? Users know better, except when they don't, they say, in the usability field. If you go to a user and ask, uh, what do you want, what do you need, uh, what kind of new technology, new system that today doesn't exist, uh, would you want for you? They will not be able to answer, except uh, strange ideas. We are the engineers. We are the ones to propose innovations. The user cannot give us the specification of the innovative product. Uh, the user we can, can help us create the innovation, can help us to validate our ideas, but they don't, they don't know what they want until they see it. When they see it, they can tell you, OK, I love it or I hate it. But you cannot ask them, design the system that they will build. It's my job to come up with the idea. OK, all of this will be the subject of the deliverable number one, which is due at the beginning of April. It's uh, two weeks after deliverable, uh, after the idea. It's not a, much, a lot of work, you say, a couple of pages. Most of the time will be spent by talking with other people, hmm? trying to, to improve our idea by talking to other people. Just keep in mind that we have the Easter vacation. So Easter vacation will be from the 22 or, or 1 of March until uh, the 30 or something. Hmm? So there's the Easter vacation period there. It's a good period for going and talk to friends and relatives outside of the Polytechnic, so you will find a lot of people which are not technology safe, and uh, just to plan the activities. By this date, you, you need uh, to complete two tasks. First task is set up a website for the project. Just remember that the, on the 18th of March, we, are, we should already have the project defined, the groups with the project titles. We will create the repositories on GitHub, and from the next day, you can start 
publishing your website, the website of your project on GitHub. Now, there is a very simple method. You, you will see that uh, uh, on, on Thursday to create a website on, on GitHub. Uh, you, you, there's already, a, say, um, a lot of templates that are just already. Mm, so don't don't worry if you don't know anything or nearly anything about web design right now. Hmm? It will be very easy to get a template and just put some information onto it. Then you can improve it over the months, over the weeks. And on the website, uh, you start trying to to describe your vision. So what we are trying to do in this course is not to come up with a set of documents, deliverable number one dot PDF, deliverable two dot PDF, and so on. But all the information that we ask for you, from you in the deliverables should be integrated in the website. We don't want to see a PDF to download. It's very boring. Nobody will read it. The website should be organized to have this information. So there will be a welcome page that describes the vision, some more details page or features or documentation or whatever page in your website that will describe the more technical information from the liberal tools and two and three. How you organize the information on the website is your choice. We don't care. We don't want to see external documents to download. We want to see that the website incorporates, integrates the information that is required. Hmm? At the beginning of April, on the 2nd of April, the information that is needed is the vision. Hmm? In the next lab, we will give you feedback on those. So we'll read all, all what you write, all, all of your websites, and then we can, we'll come, while we are working in the LADISPE on the assignments, we'll come group by group and say what, we, what is missing, what is good, what is bad from the liberal one. And this concludes uh, the first uh, step uh, problem statement, Des describing the system in a summary way. Uh, I, I give you an example uh, of a vision. Uh, an ambient intelligence system that is, uh, I call the wake kill. Huh? It's just uh, an imaginary stupid uh, MEI system just to understand the how we could write uh, this kind of uh, visions. This is an example of what I could have wrote, written on my website. Each user requires their own personalized wake-up experience. Users will never miss a wake-up call. Every morning will be a pleasing experience, and they will never be late. Hmm? Your house, your devices, your calendars will team up to personalize the optimum wake-up call, personalized to you, and personalized to your day's schedule, location, mood. Hmm? I'm talking about people, what people will get from the system. It's, uh, it's a bit stupid, but uh, the, the system will exploit different means to wake up users in the morning. It will combine ringing, turning on the lights, the radio, and other methods. We don't know yet what. According to the available devices and to user preferences, it will automatically adjust time according to the user's agenda. When the user is not at home, for example, at a hotel, it avoids activating at home devices because of the white family would be, and only users' devices. Only use users' devices, sorry for the typo. It will detect when the user actually wakes up or is already up before the wake up time. So this is an example scenario. It doesn't tell much yet. Uh, it just tells what kind of uh, daily activity I'm trying to improve and uh, some ideas about how we're trying to improve them. And uh, uh, the users will be happy hmm, to have a system that will uh, uh, optimize their wake up uh, uh, schedule. Hmm. This is each of us. Um, okay. So some description like that. Hmm. Of course, we can go on and describe the sensing part. What do I sense? Well, I sense the calendar of the user. I sense whether the user is at home or not. I sense whether the user is already awake or not. Huh? 
It needs reasoning to combine the schedule, to combine the preferences, and to check what kind of acting to do, uh, lighting up the lights, switching, on, switching the lights on, uh, switching the radio on, uh, ringing, uh, or cold water, or whatever, whatever, whatever means uh, we, we decide to use. And the interaction would be the, some way for the user to switch the ringer off and also to personalize it, to express their ideal wake-up schedule or method. So in the, the vision, which we will also describe this uh, this kind. I never mentioned Bluetooth. I never mentioned smartphone. I never mentioned internet. I never mentioned Wi-Fi or whatever, right? Because actually, when you are a zip, you don't care about technology. OK, this is the first step. Then you already have a, a brochure, a presentation, a one-page presentation, actually two pages. One is to read, and the other is the MEA features to be listed, to be used to present our, your project. At that point, you need to be more precise. The second step is what we call the definition or elicitation of the requirements. Elicitation is a word that says, uh, that means something like pulling out. Huh? Uh, trying to dig and pull out the requirements from, from where? From the technology, from the users, from the environment, and describe from what we know, from what we can pull up, from, pull out, from what we can investigate, hmm? trying to finds a list of requirements. Requirements are things that the system needs to do. What the system needs to do. So we need to consider the ideas, the opinion of the users. We already have some of them collected from the first step. And also opinions of the stakeholders. So some other people that might be interested in the system working, even if they are not real users. One, one is example. If the user is a pet, is an animal, then the stakeholder is the pet owner, the owner of this animal. So it will not be the real user, but it, it has an interest that the system will work well. In the wake kill, in the, in the wake up system, maybe one person is the user, but also its family have an interest. They're not, they are not going to use the system, but they have an interest that the system works well. It works the person up and doesn't bother all the rest of the family, for example. Or the office colleagues are stakeholders because then this person will be always on time. Or maybe if they reschedule a meeting at a later time, the person can sleep more. Hmm? So there will be other people that are interested in the system that can express some requirements, ideas, or requests about what the system could do, even if they are not the real user, but there are something, somebody that who's, who is more or less interested that the, the system can work well. And uh, once you collect more information, maybe you need to adapt your vision, you do modify it. It's always possible to go back and modify. Just don't throw everything away, but try to adjust it. And then you come up with a set of uh, requirements. Um, this task is something that uh, takes a lot of time. You need to find maybe 10 potential users, organize some groups of discussion, find some stakeholders, do some interviews, and so on. Huh? If for a real product, I would really consider doing this. In the MEA course, we don't have the time. It's not very demanding in terms of work hours. But if you need to find people, put them together, and the weeks go by. Hmm? And so we don't require doing anything formal from this point of view. What I will suggest is uh, try to, 
to speak to some people and to gather some information informally. There are formal ways of doing this, processes for doing this. It's, it's important. Huh? But we have to skip this or really to shrink it very much because otherwise we won't have time to implement the system. So it's a pity, but uh, um, okay. Here we have the definitions of what the users and or the stakeholders are. You should be able to speak or to find potential users, the person that will be the final target of the system, or persons that have that have very similar characteristics. So maybe you don't have a person that will actually really use the system. But you find a person with more or less the same age, more or less the same job, that can maybe, that, that, you, that you know, and you can uh, actually interview or discuss with them. The users don't need to understand how the system works, once again. They need to understand what the system does. No, not how it does it. In fact, they need to understand how they can interact with the system. Stakeholders are other persons or institutions that can have an interest in the success of the system. Maybe users or maybe not users, other people that are not direct users of the system. And the interest here is defined in a broad sense, maybe an economic interest, maybe an efficient interest, maybe a better satisfaction or whatever. So these are the two groups uh, of people that are around the system, that are in the corner watching us and waiting for the system to come out and to use it. Um, this is the part of the process we cannot do formally. There are a lot of uh, steps that are involved in the so-called user-centered design methodologies. <coughs> we are we say that the methodology is user-centered when at every design step, so at every step during the process, users and users are involved in some way. Maybe for an interview, maybe for a trial, maybe for testing a prototype, at every step, since the beginning to the end. And there are different methodologies for doing that. And I just want to to mention this if, if we don't have time to explain it in course or to, to develop that during the projects, because I, I would like to, uh, to keep the idea that involving users is one key factor in the success of, the, of your projects. Because it minimizes the risk that the final product will not be liked, but the user will not be bought by anyone. So maybe you have a very sophisticated system that nobody wants to use. And uh, OK, you can read these uh, uh, comics uh, from the slides uh, that uh, play the idea of involving users. Uh, the user-centered design requirements are a, very set, a set of uh, methodologies that are also described in an ISO document um, where users are involved throughout all design and development and the design is driven and refined by user evaluation. So it means that at, at every step you are not alone in decide what to do, what features to include or to exclude, but you can have users or potential users to help you. The design team includes multidisciplinary skills and perspectives. So that's why, that's one of the reasons we don't adopt a UCD, a formal UCD methodology, but we suggested you to form multidisciplinary teams. Because every one of you will bring a different angle uh, to the project, will bring a different view. Okay? And all of them, all, all views are important for the success of the system. And then there are, of course, in these UCD user-centered design methodologies, there are a lot of tools. Huh? Uh, I just mentioned the most important ones, uh, uh, personas. So imagine you have uh, users. It, 
the tool, and every time you need, uh, at every step, to check whether a given functionality, for example, do I want an icon to delete an appointment? Yes or not? Uh, let's ask the users. Uh, it would be very demanding, because for every design choice, you need to invite 10 users and have a discussion about that icon or whatever. So what you do is to build uh, abstract users. We call them personas. A persona is a, is a typical user. And you describe them like they were your friends, like you knew them. Uh, Jane has 22 years, so does this kind of work. Her, her daily schedule is this. She likes uh, to bike, she likes to eat, or whatever. So we have a description of these people. And so during the design, we, we ask ourselves, what Jane would do here? Uh, we try to put ourselves into the shoes into, of other imaginary people, and, but this, this imaginary people has been described by trying to um, capture the types of users, the type of, of customers that you expect. Hmm? So it's a powerful tool just to describe by name, like we knew them, hmm? like they were real people, and see what these real but imaginary people would do in this context. So it's very easy uh, to imagine the system instead of an abstract, what the user will do. Well, the user will, it will be confused because you have many users, many types of users. Some are younger, some are older, some are more technical, some are less. And so it will be difficult. So either you involve real persons or you imagine what they would do using personas. And these personas will use the system so it would be diff very difficult to say, well, this, pers will, this person or this user will click here. You always need to build scenarios, not just single actions. Uh, imagine moments of interaction with the system. Hmm? So stories in which these personas use the system. These are just you know, conceptual tools that help you think about what the users want. And then there are practical tools, uh, like uh, how to do questionnaires, how to do interviews, and so on, which are beyond uh, the time that we have uh, in this course for this topic. But if anybody of you is interested, the keywords are user-centered design and user experience. There's a lot of information there to help you be better designers. So at the end, what do you have? You understand better your system, and you, have, you will have priorities for your features. You will understand that some features of the system are more important to your users. And so you will have the information of what are the most important features from the user point of view, not the ones that are easier to implement, not the ones uh, that you like most, but the ones that your users will appreciate most. Hmm? <coughs> you will also get a constraint. OK, but the user, if it's a nice device, yes. But it's a big box, I won't use it because it's too classy, I don't like it. Or if it's too expensive, I cannot use it, and so on. Hmm? So uh, given a set of functionalities, the user can also have other constraints. Aesthetical constraints, size, weight, price, and so on, hmm? that, that you can take into account. So we want to transform, we want to talk to the users to, to transform a good idea, a good vision, into a system that the users want. Hmm? That's the goal. And uh, these are the two other main references if you want to study more on the topic. As I said, we won't follow these methodologies here, but try just to do that uh, uh, informally or intuitively, keeping that in, in mind. This comic, I can give you time to read it, say that a system that includes 100, 400 fine features uh, is too complex, no human, would be able to use a product with that level of complexity. 
And so the manager says, OK, I will add easy to use to the list of requirements. So it will be 401. This is the wrong approach. Uh, easy to use is not something to add at the end. Rather, it's something to keep in mind since the beginning. So we will never come with 400 different features, of which maybe only 12 are important for the users. OK? I think this summarizes more or less my point. <coughs> so step one, problem statement. Step two, user feedback. Step three, and this is something that we need to do. We said step two is more or less in, informal. The step three is identifying the requirements. Step two was elicitation of the requirements, trying to pull out from the users what they really want. Step three is uh, formalizing them. We write them down. We make our choices. We have a lot of information from the users, a lot of information from the users. But now we decide what will be in the system and what will not. The users know better, but they know better or better rest of them. No? Uh, I know more because I want to build a system. I, as designer of the system, I have the final word uh, whether to include it or not in the system. So the initial vision, the user input, all the information that we have that says how great our system will be, must be decomposed and analyzed and separated in many independent requirements. We must delete everything which is not essential, what is in and what is out. Ah, this feature is nice. OK, we agree that it's nice. Do we want it in the system or not? But it's nice. Yes, it's nice. But do you want it or not? Are you willing to pay for it or not? Are you willing to spend a week to implement it or not? But it's nice. Yes, but do you want it in the system or not? OK, so we, we need to make choices. And making choices always makes somebody angry. But we need to select. Have we gather information for allowing us to make the best choices. But then we need to make choices. But it's nice. OK. So we need to select from the whole list of ideas the ones that we finally go into our project. And what the system does, trying to build a list of different features, different functionalities that the system will implement. We must ensure that this list will maximize the satisfaction of our users and will still respect the MEI nature of the project. But at the end, we will have a list of features that we will try to imagine that as a contract, a document that specifies that requires, it's called a requirement document, requires, prescribes what the system needs to do. OK? That is the contract between you, you as the specification engineer, and you as the implementation engineer. These requirements should be very, let's say, easy to read. Very easy to check. And it's not easy to write uh, good requirements. Huh? We need to describe the system services, so what the system is going to do, and the constraints. So why the system needs to inter interact or with some other system that poses a constraint, the battery life, uh, the usability, the weight, are all design constraints we, we need to make explicit. We need to write down. Hmm? So what the system can do and what are the, the limits, huh? the design envelope in which the system will be designed. Hmm? What are the things that we cannot do? The system may, may run, uh, for example, one design constraint is the system needs uh, 
internet connectivity? Yes or no? If you say yes, then you have a, a lot of consequences. So if, if the system is portable, you need uh, an, a 3G um, SIM inside or smartphone to go with it, and, and so on. If you say no, it doesn't need internet connectivity, so then you will need, so it may or may not have a connectivity, then you will need to re um, think about what will happen to the system, what will do when the connectivity is not there. Hmm? So it's an external choice that you have to do. But then it, the kind of environment, technical environment, in which the system lives uh, will have an uh, impact uh, on uh, the functionalities that the system will need to implement. What is the requirement? Hmm? Up to now, I just used this word uh, informally. Uh, well, there are different levels of requirements, first of all. There may be very, something very abstract, very general, like uh, the system should be secure. Should not uh, so use personal data of the user. The system should be fast. This actually is not a requirement. But uh, the system response time should, should be less than half a second. Or maybe something very detailed. I don't know, the, the location of the user will be determined uh, with an error less than one meter. Hmm? Or the database will uh, occupy less than 20 megabytes of space, or this space. Or the user interface will have uh, five different areas. Hmm? Uh, we have some, a subset of the requirements that uh, are easier to understand, also for the final users, are some less, sometimes similar to the vision, and some are more, te more technical in nature. Uh, actually, if you, if you go out and see uh, how the, um, the companies uh, work, uh, you see that they call requirements uh, actually two different kinds of, uh, of documents. One is, uh, I'm a company, I need a, a product, so I publish a bid for, uh, for finding contractors that are willing to build my system. So in this case, I don't need, or I, neither, I don't want to describe the system in every detail. I describe the main feature that I want. And then it's up to the contractor to fill in the details. So this will be simpler um, requirements. Huh? In Italian, we would call it capitolato. Huh? So what we want from the contractors is not a, a design. On the other hand, when I sign the contract, I want everything to be listed in detail. So that uh, at the end, uh, I can check whether the work has been done correctly. Whether the implemented system actually matches what we had agreed uh, some months before. So it's a big, uh, it's a big uh, say, area, the definition of requirements. Some requirements are important for the users to understand, for the user or the customer or stakeholder. We call them user requirements, and these need to be written in a language that can be understood also by the users. Not all of them. Some are developer requirements. So at some point, you will write down what are the libraries you use, what is the language you use, what is the coding standard, what is the implementation choices, and so on. And all of these is something that the user will never be able to understand, but they won't need to understand it. So they call them system requirements or developer requirements. So imagine a part of the requirements, some of them are very easy to read, should be very easy to read, because it's the interest of the user to understand them. And some are very technical that you need for yourself for guiding the development process. In your case, it's very likely that these ones uh, will be just informal. You just decide among yourself what to do because the time is, uh, you, you work cl very closely uh, and in a short time, so uh, 
maybe we don't need all of them. No? We, need to formal, we don't need to formalize them. Uh, so for example, this is an example of a, a user requirement. So saying that uh, describing a system, uh, imagine a, a web system that enables users to edit documents. So for the user point of view, we say that the software must provide a means of representing and accessing external files editing, edited by other tools. Means that the user can upload to the system files that can be edited by different tools. Maybe a Word file, a PowerPoint file, you click on it, you will open the program and so on. This kind of description is enough for the user to understand a given macro functionality of the system. Okay, yes, I need it. It's useful. It's not just uploading and downloading files, but I can also edit them in different formats. Nice, I want it. I can pay for it. But it's not enough for implementing the system. For, for implementation, you need to be more detailed. For example, we need to be able to define what kind of external files. Yes, Word and PowerPoint, yes. And Excel, yes or no? PDF, AutoCAD? You mean, we need to make a list. And uh, every file type, every type of file is associated to a tool. Maybe different users will have different sets of tools on their computers. So you need to personalize the association between the type of file and the type of tool. For every, for every file type, you, name, you must define a different icon. We can say, of course. The user expects to have a different icon. So, in fact, this detail is not described in the user requirements. But for the implementation of the system, we must think about it and say, okay, this means we also need this feature. Define an icon associated to a file type, the page for setting the icon, for deleting it, for changing all new functions. Hmm? That are just a consequence of how we can implement this uh, user requirement, and so on. If you browse through this second list, the system requirement certification, you can see that each of these items actually is uh, one or two or three web pages or buttons or actions in the user interface. We are building a list of to-dos, a list, a list of functions to implement in our system. But we are, we are building it starting from user actions. If we want the user to do this, then, of course, we will need this and this and this and that small functions. Hmm? From the user to the implementation. We always feel, uh, go in this uh, order. One, One very important uh, distinction of the requirements is between functional and non-functional requirements. I give the definition now, and then we spend more, more time on this topic uh, next time. But start thinking about that. The functional requirements are the list uh, of uh, features or actions or services that the system can do. I can log in into the system. I can write a post. I can upload an image. I can add a friend and discover in Facebook. I can check notifications. I can browse my well, things act different features of the system. If you describe the system as a long list of functions that the user can activate on the system, you can delete any one of them. They are independent. Would it be possible to imagine a Facebook where you cannot check notifications? Maybe it wouldn't be so nice, but it can be done. Would you imagine a version of Facebook when you cannot upload images? Yes, everything has can work. 
Okay? Functional specification, so the things, the actions that the system can do, are a list of independent functions. Each one of them may be implemented or not. And this is also very easy for testing. I, can I check whether the requirement number 27 is implemented? Let's go. OK, it says uh, that the user can like uh, a post. OK, let's go find a post, try to like it. Or like it. You can check it. It's independent from any, anything else. But not all requirements of a system can be described in this way, things that uh, the system does. Others, which are also important, are the non-functional requirements that describe how the system can implement its functions. For example, the response time, the speed of the system, the scalability, the number of users, the compatibility, what kind of browser you can use. Right? All of these qualities that the system must have that are more horizontal, more pervasive. They are not just uh, focused in one point in one function. So we need to be able to identify both uh, functional and non-functional requirements and list them for our project. We continue on Thursday trying to give more examples about these uh, kind of requirements.